of waste management and resource management uh, strategies and finish up by mentioning a few things in green engineering and environmental biotechnology. Now Easter Island, for those of you who are not familiar, is an island about 2,000 miles from uh, the coast of South America. It was discovered in the 18th century. You know, it's always very interesting how whenever Europeans go to some place, they say they discovered it. But of course, there were people living there a long time before that. Uh, but when they found it, it was a very barren island, uh, maybe about 3,000 people, very poor, eking out a living. The soil was rocky, there was no fresh water, but there were these huge stone statues all over the island. Now, I'm sure many of you have seen pictures of those statues. Now, how is it that on this island, 3,000 miles, 2,500 miles from anywhere, there are these big monuments? created. That meant that there was a thriving civilization there at one time. So what is the story of Easter Island? Well, it was colonized back in 400 AD by Polynesians, because if you look on the geography coming from the uh, east of, or rather the west of Easter Island, that would be Polynesia. And at that time, it was very thickly covered with vegetation. When the Europeans found it in 1700, there was no trees almost on the island. There were just these statues. And they cleared spaces, and they developed a very prosperous agricultural society. Okay? Uh, they had a very healthy diet, and they had a rich life. And how do we know they had a rich life? Because they made these huge statues. You don't make statues if you are trying to make a living, right? You're trying to feed yourself and worrying about whether you have enough water or food or, uh, and so on. So they had a very, very rich life and they cut down trees because they used that to roll the statues to different parts of the island. Okay? And eventually, almost all the trees were gone. They cut all the trees down in search, in pursuit of spreading these statues all over the place. So obviously, once the trees were gone, you all have some awareness of what uh, trees do. They hold the soil in place, uh, so the topsoils lost their anchor. There were no forests to absorb the rain and replenish the groundwater, so therefore the island streams and rivers dried up. And then the population, which at one point was about 7,000, remember this is a very small island, uh, it collapsed very quickly. So quickly that there were lots of unfinished statues so what does that tell you? These people, their rich life, producing all these things, they were still carving those statues, even while their environment was collapsing. Okay? So what are the lessons that we can learn from this? Well, the first lesson is very simple. We know that. Resources are finite. Okay? They're going to end. But what's the second lesson? Our human capacity to exploit the environment is actually infinite. We seem to have an infinite capacity to exploit the environment, despite all of the warning signals that we are getting from what we see happening around us. Okay? So I use this as a parable for what's happening on this planet. We are, in fact, consuming the resources of this planet so rapidly but we are not, only a few of us seem to be aware of the degradation and devastation that happens to be taking place. Many of us still operate under the assumption that the environment is infinite and that we can continue to exploit it. But of course, we all know that the environment is not infinite. Resources are not infinite. So with that little parable, let's talk about resource use uh, in the in the world. So this is a little diagram showing you the environment, which basically means the air, <coughs> the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, the lithosphere, and of course all the humans and ecosystems uh, that comprise the planet Earth. And of course, industry draws ecological goods and services to make economic value for society. Society is our communities, it's us, it's government. We draw ecological goods and services to be utilized. Of course, industry utilizes labor from here. But in the process of doing that, we dump a lot of wastes back into the environment. 
So we have this big red arrow that is, in fact, polluting the environment and degrading the environment. So if you look at that sort of schematically, here's our planet. We have solar energy coming in. This is the air, water, minerals, oil, plants, etc. all the natural resources that we draw upon from the environment and uh, have a quality of life that we have for ourselves. So we need to look at this big red arrow because the title of my talk was Waste No Resource Yes. And the whole idea is to not think of this stream as a waste stream, but rather to think of it as a resource stream that in fact can provide the inputs that we need to make the goods and services that make our lives possible. Now that waste stream is pretty complex. And this is just a breakdown uh, of the different components of the waste stream. We're all very familiar with the MSW, the Municipal Solid Waste Stream. But if you look at that, municipal waste is actually a very, very small percent, 10 to 12 percent, maybe even less depending on the different countries and different uses of the actual total waste. So most of our attention here has been focused on this MSW, the Municipal Waste Stream. And in fact, most of the technologies that I've heard about today uh, rather in this conference and some of the papers that I've, the titles of the papers that I've seen address that municipal waste stream. But I want to remind you that we have a whole bunch of other stuff that we need to address, including uh, mining waste, manufacturing waste, uh, waste from wastewater sludges, and then of course hazardous waste as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and hazardous waste generation is sort of shown over here. Uh, and what you can see, this is just a graphic from, um, uh, it's from the UN and India didn't report producing any hazardous waste, which is not true. Uh, so uh, just let's look at the MSW stream from various countries. So you have countries like uh, the OECD countries, which are the developed countries. And then we have some waste from Asian cities. And you can see that the, uh, the, uh, uh, the proportion of organic waste in the municipal waste stream is much larger in the developing countries than it is in the OECD countries. In fact, in India, if you look at the composition of uh, the solid waste stream, almost 50% is by the organic waste stream. And if you add uh, paper to that and rags, uh, you have over 50 to 60 percent organic waste. So that's a, a, a good waste stream that can be targeted for uh, biodegradation by organic types of uh, mechanisms. And this is again solid waste composition in various cities. So looking here, uh, again, uh, the organic component and these are all, as you can see, developing country cities. The organic component is very large. And if you look at that or, uh, the total waste stream, the organic waste, which is things like vegetables, fruit peels, you know, food waste, etc., they can be degraded in about a week. Paper takes longer, maybe about three weeks. Cotton cloth, two to five months. But then you have these other items that will not be degraded. So obviously that speaks to the need for separating out your waste stream so that you can actually tackle it. Now the other side of the waste issue is not just the generation of waste, but the collection of waste. Uh, I've noticed in, in India this seems to be very common, common, there's open dumping. So people are dumping things out into the public space and that isn't waste that's being collected for treatment. Uh, so here you have municipal solid waste generation in Africa, uh, in South Asia, and this is of course the OECD, which includes the US, Canada, and Europe. And you can see that they actually are the largest generators of uh, uh, municipal solid waste. <coughs> Excuse me. But they also collect the most municipal solid waste. If you look at South Asia, we're only collecting about 60%. And I question that number uh, as well. Uh, but we've been making progress 
If you look at what's happening, this is uh, uh, looking at municipal solid waste, uh, the generation. It's not been increasing too much. This is going from 1995 to 2009, maybe about a 20% increase in uh, uh, waste generation, but there's about a 200% almost increase in the waste recovery. So we are making progress, but we have a long way uh, to go. Uh, and in this plot, we also see how municipal waste going to the landfill is actually decreasing. And the other thing that has been mentioned here about incineration is it's not a very favorable technology because of all the problems. So there's actually a big reduction in the amount of municipal waste that is being incinerated. Uh, waste generation is tied closely to income. If you look at annual income, uh, low income countries, they're only generating about 0.1 ton per uh, capita per year, whereas if you go to the high income countries, more than $10,000 per capita per year, it's going up to more than one ton per capita per year. Uh, and if you look at the share of total waste disposed, and if you look at uh, uh, what happens in the open dump, notice that in North America, nothing goes to the open dump. That's because there's enough regulations in place, but a large number, uh, a large component, 90%, is being put into a sanitary landfill, nothing is being burned, uh, and nothing is being incinerated. In Asia and the Pacific, only about 50% goes to the, the open dump, 30% uh, in, the, in the landfill, and we have open burning and incineration. Our recycling rate is also quite low, so we need to improve that. So now what I want to do is actually get to the crux of uh, what I'm talking about, which is how waste management uh, had, or resource management, I should correct myself, has been evolving over time. The pre-industrial economy was a zero waste economy. Everything that we produced and used went back somehow into the environment, was degraded, and became part of the environment again because there were no synthetic materials. Uh, after the industrial revolution in the 18th and the 19th century, we started generating liquid, gaseous, and solid wastes, but the disposal practice was, let's put it out of sight, it means it's out of mind, and so we don't have to worry about it. And that was okay when there was a lot of land to do this, when the intensity of the industrial production was not so high, uh, but then we get to the middle and late middle 20th century, we realized there was an environmental problem, uh, some of you have probably heard of Rachel Carson in Silent Spring, talking about how organic, synthetic, uh, rather, uh, chlorinated organic materials were poisoning wildlife and killing birds. So they started doing some minimal, uh, what we call end of pipe treatment, and started looking at the remediation of actual industrial and hazardous waste sites. Then we get into the 20th century, and the late 20th century, and things started becoming a little more scientific. Uh, there were regulations established for the disposal of hazardous materials and environmental wastes. We became increasingly sophisticated in terms of how we treated the pollutants coming up from the end of the pipe, and we focused our attention on remediating, that is cleaning up, industrial and hazardous waste sites, and the whole idea of pollution minimization, uh, which is what is the old green engineering, uh, came to, to rise, and, uh, and we, uh, of course, we developed the three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle, and we came up with this cradle-to-grave uh, philosophy about uh, material production. That is, the producer was responsible for what they produced from the time it was created till the time it was destroyed. So, in fact, I believe in Germany, uh, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but BMW has a responsibility to take back their old cars uh, and once the life of the car is over. As a producer, they have that responsibility for that material. And my contention is that this late 20th century approach is good, but it's not good enough for the 21st century. And what we need to do is approach a zero waste uh, uh, mentality. So we need to expand our reduce, reuse, recycle to include recover, recovering what materials we can, and being able to treat and convert the wastes into innocuous products. 
so that we uh, develop uh, processes that dispose nothing or as little as possible. And instead of talking about pollution minimization, we have to talk about pollution prevention so that we don't create the toxic materials in the first place, i.e. do not think waste, think resource. So instead of cradle to, uh, to grave, we now have cradle to cradle so that a resource it is used to generate some kind of product. Five minutes? Three minutes. Okay, so, uh, so, so instead of thinking of that going to the grave, we have to do cradle to cradle, which is the new green engineering and target specific chemicals, <coughs> excuse me, for cleanup. So this is the hierarchy where we want to look at what is most desirable, and you saw this yesterday in one of the uh, uh, brief presentations. So we want to eliminate waste that are being produced, that's the most preferable, going all the way through minimization, reuse and recycle, recovery, treatment, manage and contain storage, and disposal in landfills. Unfortunately, what is happening a lot is still improper waste disposal and storage, uh, so we need to address that. This just gives you a little more detail, uh, source separation, including the various kinds of technologies that can be used, uh, to, to address that. So let me finish by just showing two slides here, although I have a few more slides. Uh, green engineering is got to take uh, processes like this, where you see you have a process with two reaction, reactants producing a product and coming up with a waste, but that waste has now got to be reconceptualized as an input into another process where we will produce another product. So that we're no longer getting these wastes, but we're in fact uh, doing the kind of process analysis, the process research and modification uh, to, ex to come up with waste elimination. So that's green engineering. And then environmental biotechnology is being able to now start converting our thinking from doing chemical synthesis to doing biological type of synthesis which will allow us to redesign our processes that will prevent the discharge of pollutants and allow the cleanup of uh, different uh, contaminated environments. An example is the production of plastics, which is based on oil, but now we can do it uh, using uh, biological uh, mechanisms. So we have, for, for example, degradable plastics. So this is an example of biodegradable plastic, and you see if you come into this full circle, it's a zero waste process. We have examples from the production of fuels. So instead of going by the petroleum-based route, we come in producing ethanol from biomass, either using cellulose enzyme technology, which is emerging. Uh, we have biodiesel that is replacing petrodiesel. It's very simple to make. Uh, this will be available, hopefully, as a PDF to uh, individuals who are attending this conference, we have biogas, which many of you are familiar with. Uh, and then I also wanted to talk about hazardous wastes, but I think I'm running out of time. So I'll just point out that the two methods of hazardous waste treatment, which is incineration, uh, that is to burn it or bury it, incineration or landfilling, incineration is expensive, and it in inevitably leads to the emission of more toxic materials, such as dioxins and benzophilines. The main reason being, you need at least 1,200 degrees centigrade everywhere in the furnace. Uh, and then, of course, uh, with landfilling, we have to look about le leachates and so on. You're going to contaminate groundwater. You have volatile com compounds being uh, released. So my suggestion or my recommendation, again, is we come up with biological waste treatment technology. So I'm just going to skip through those. Uh, which talk about some of the factors, the favorable and unfavorable conditions for it, various kinds of microbe uh, waste that have been treated by different kinds of microbes, uh, and the different hierarchies, the fact that we can use algae, fungi, vermicompost, and phytoremediation, uh, and eventually what we're trying to do is get to sustainability for all. But we need to be broad-minded about this. When we talk about the triple bottom line, which is planet, people, and profit, we have to interrogate that further. We've got to talk about whose environment we're trying to save, which people we're trying to benefit, and who is going to, be, uh, who is going to get the profit. We need to talk about equity and justice, 
So that when we talk about resource, resource management for the 21st century, it's imperative that we're knowledgeable about the resources that we use in terms of materials and energy, that we become aware of all the conservation strategies that are available, we're sensitive to resource use and reuse, and that we expand our mindset from the six, uh, three R's to the six R's, respecting the environment, rethinking our processes, and recovering all of those materials, and coming up with a more system-wide approach to material chain tracking and looking at closed loop production. So thank you for your attention, uh, and I'll be happy to answer any questions.